uh, Congresswoman Del Bene, who is a co-author with me on the, the LEADS Act. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Bitkower, for being with us today. Um, the DOJ argued in the Microsoft Ireland case that congressional inaction with respect to updating the Electronic Communications Privacy Act is evidence of legislative intent and that Congress generally thinks the law is fine, um, that the courts should feel free to apply it to all of the unique situations that arise given the way technology works today, um, including international data storage. Now, uh, as was mentioned by m my colleague from Texas moments ago, are you aware that this committee has held hearings and announced plans to mark up the Email Privacy Act and that there are over 300 co-sponsors on that b very basic reform bill waiting for this committee to take it up and over 100 on the LEADS Act that addresses the international question. I am aware of those facts, yes. Um, so you've indicated that DOJ's position is that in all cases, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act as written reaches data overseas. So where it's stored doesn't matter. Uh, with respect to the government's ability to compel a provider to disclose information, it does not matter where the provider chooses to store that information, that's correct. Now, um, you know, Congress is looking at a number of ways to update Electronic Communications Privacy Act to account for the global nature um, of cloud computing um, and the needs of law enforcement to access critical evidence. But some of the threshold questions that we've discussed include the citizenship of the account holder, the location of the data, or the headquarters of the company holding the data. Would you say that the DOJ's position is that ECPA, as written, already addresses questions about how to handle data stored abroad and that all of these questions are essentially superfluous to, to, and we shouldn't be asking them? Uh, so I think ECPA today currently does not make distinctions that restrict the government's ability to investigate based on the nationality of the account holder. And it does not make distinctions about the DOJ's ability to investigate based on where the data is stored. We think that's a wise course to continue with because there are many investigations where we need to take action where the individual may be abroad, the individual may not be an American. So we obviously we are concerned with legislation that would unilaterally strip our authority to investigate in those cases. So if we follow the model that says it's based on a, a company, um, then, and I think this was mentioned earlier as well, China could make subsidiaries of Chinese companies in the U.S. turn over whatever information it wants. Is that a desirable outcome? Uh, that is certainly not a desirable outcome, and that's in fact why we are looking for a creative way forward that would address conflicts of laws in targeted ways that lower those conflicts in cases where we have legitimate requests from companies that respect, countries that respect rights, uh, but we can pick and choose which country to make a deal with. So many, many of us would agree, though, that the, the MLAT system is in need of modernization to function officially in a digital age. Um, could you share with the committee how many times an MLAT has been used to obtain data stored overseas versus a warrant stored under the Stored Communications Act? So it's difficult to answer that question because for the most part, if you're talking about the context of the SCA, the government is not aware where the data is stored. So if a company complies with an SCA warrant, we won't know one way or the other where the company got that data from Seattle, San Francisco, or Ireland. Uh, so I can't give you an answer to that question. Uh, I can only give answers based on the information we've received from companies when we serve that process on them. But can you give us your best estimation of that answer then? So this may not be a, a scientific answer, have? but uh, uh, to our knowledge, uh, in the history of serving SCA warrants on U.S. providers, uh, we have never been told that they cannot comply because of the conflict of law. Um, it's my understanding that before the Microsoft Ireland case, standard practice in these circumstances was to use the MLAT process. So if the MLAT process is broken, it's, you know, I would urge the DOJ to start working with Congress on reforms um, ran, ran, rather than coming up with new legal theories that apparently um, it, you've relied on in the past to get there. And I really would love to get more information on the difference of these numbers if you can provide those to us. So we'd be happy to work with you on that. Uh, I guess the one, the one area where I would, um, I think it's important to, to clarify is that there was no change in DOJ policy for, uh, or in the law for, for upwards of three decades. It's been the clear law of the United States that lawful process served on an American company can require that company to bring data back from abroad. We have never heard from an SCA provider, to my knowledge, that they cannot comply with one of those warrants because of the conflict of law. 
if we were ever told so in a given situation, we would take that very seriously. We would work with the provider and endeavor to see what that conflict of law is. Uh, if there is a true conflict, we'd try to see if there are ways around that. That situation has not actually occurred yet, including in the Microsoft Ireland case, where, as I said before, Microsoft has not alleged any conflict of law. In fact, Microsoft submitted a declaration on behalf of itself, and Ireland submitted a declaration on behalf of itself, and neither one have alleged a conflict of law in that situation. So we take very seriously conflicts of laws. We do it across a variety of investigative contexts. Nearly every one of our financial investigations involving banks and the like involve claims of conflicts of laws. We work through those processes. If we do proceed to a compulsion action in court, the court is then empowered to balance important considerations, including comedy, including the value to the investigation, including the burden that might be faced in the company. And we take all of those very seriously. Our concern is with legislation that in every single case, if there was a conflict, would resolve that conflict against law enforcement and in favor of the foreign country. Um, my time's expired. I think we need laws so that work the way the world works today, and that's going to be critical for us all to follow up on. Um, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to all of you for being with us today. Um, Mr. Smith, when ECPO was written many years ago, as you were highlighting in 1986, um, it was also the very early days of email. When I first started working on email in 1989, even then it was still really only used in companies that had it for internal communications. And if you did get an email, folks always downloaded it from a server because capacity in servers was very low. And, um, and they would regularly delete those servers to have room for new information. Um, so it seems clear that some of the fundamental technical assumptions that were made when ECPA was written have definitely changed vastly since then. And I wondered if you could comment on the mechanics of cloud computing today and what legal questions that creates, especially with respect to ECPA. Um, and why can't the courts just shoehorn a kind of all of these today's legal issues into, like the international storage issue, into that old law? Well, I think your question raises an excellent point. Um, a company like Microsoft built its first data center outside the United States only in 2010. So cloud computing and the explosion of cloud computing is really a phenomenon of this decade. That is what has created all of these issues that we're talking about today, and it has created the need at times for law enforcement, quite rightly, to want to get access to information, to content, to email in other countries. I think the fundamental question, in a sense, from a U.S. legal perspective, is that when technology moves forward and the law needs to catch up, as it does here, what's the best way for that to happen? And we would say the best way is for the executive branch, if it wants new power, to come back to Congress and ask Congress to enact it. And when you say when the law was written, it was written actually with respect to the way technology was working then, as opposed to providing intent going forward. Well, absolutely. And the most interesting and telling aspect of ECPA in this regard is the fact that it applied a lower standard to protect email that was over six months old. And that was all based on some thinking in the 1980s that I think barely anybody can remember, that most businesses moved their paper records off site after six months. Maybe that was true, but who the heck has an email account that has only email that's less than six months old? The answer is only email accounts that have been open less than six months ago. All the rest of us have email that's older than that, and that just shows how much the world has changed. And with the shift to cloud computing now, more and more of that information is stored on servers. Well, the amazing thing about the cloud, as you point out quite rightly, is now we're not only talking about email, we're talking about all the photographs of our lives, we're talking about all of the other digital records that we have, we're talking about the PDFs uh, that, that in our lives, it's, it's everything that sort of documents what we do every day. Mm -hmm. And do you think that um, people should have a different expectation of how digital information is treated versus physical information? Is, is there a legal significance to the fact that um, you might have information that's in digital form versus paper form? I think that technology needs to advance, but certain timeless values need to endure. And among these timeless values are the rights to privacy. And every time the American public has been asked, they have said the same thing. 
They want the data they store in the cloud to get the same privacy protection as the information they store on paper. And I think that's exactly the right point of view. Does anyone else think there's a difference between digital or, or paper in terms of the legal significance and that differentiation? Um, I, I agree with Mr. Smith. I think one of the challenges here, frankly, is um, people sometimes because of the fact that the data moves uh, electronically and seamlessly conflate what is a business record of the provider with what is something that the provider holds as a custodian, so to speak. And to use an example from the banking world, uh, it's one thing to subpoena a bank for bank records, which are the bank's own documents or the bank's own information. It's another thing if you want to get into a safety deposit box. The bank doesn't have a limitless right to enter the box, and therefore you need a warrant for the box that's separate and distinct from a subpoena for the business records. And because electronic uh, data doesn't neatly fall into that obvious category, categorization, there's a tendency to conflate the two, but I think as, as Brad says, that the principles ought to be the same. I would just say, the two factors that strike me as the most significant here are first, the incredible amount of digital data that is now created and available. Digital dust or digital footprints of your daily life are everywhere created. And they are also, second point, stored with third parties in a way that they did not used to be. And so I find myself in strong agreement with Mr. Smith uh, when he had his 1912 adding machine in front of him. It is, I think, important and appropriate for Congress to look at the All Writs Act again. I would go further and suggest you also consider the technical assistance provisions in both the Wiretap Act and FISA to clarify exactly what kind of assistance is going to be required from third parties in making digital data in the clear available to the government. You know, at one extreme is legislation now pending in the UK, which, if I read it correctly, would essentially allow them to compel providers to push down widgets, malware, in bulk uh, across a network and all users on that network. And at the other extreme would be, you know, essentially no compelled assistance. There's going to be a middle ground there, and I think Congress is the appropriate institution of our government to come to grips with that.